This is the 10th Eden webinar. Um, we're delighted, though, that this 10th one is actually a collaboration between Eden and ICDE, the International Council for Open and Distance Education. And that's uh, reflected in the panel members, as you'll hear shortly. Um, for those of you who might be attending the first time, um, all of the webinars are recorded and available on the Eden website, as this webinar will be too. We also really invite your questions, your participation. Um, the panel are waiting with anticipation to respond to your questions. To make it a little easier for us to manage, we ask that you use the Q&A tool if you're viewing and participating in Zoom, and that allows us to respond to your questions. At the same time, please do also, though, converse in the chat box if you want to continue conversing with fellow participants. Um, I don't think there's much else to remind you at this stage. Um, the general format is that we'll start off with introductions. We have a, a framing question that the webinar is focused on how do we plan for education after the pandemic? So we'll address that question. Um, and then over the next 60 minutes, might extend a little longer. We've had over 500 participants in some of the webinars, so sometimes it takes a little while to be able to work through as many questions as possible. Um, we'll uh, try to do full justice to the topic. It's a challenging topic um, as we are all uh, around the world uh, currently thinking beyond the current crisis. In fact, I think what's useful as an uh, introduction to our panel members is I think I'm right in saying that we have uh, three continents represented here. Uh, we have both hemispheres represented. Um, and if we really want to stretch it, those of you who know my background, even though I'm based in Ireland, I'm originally from New Zealand. So we can say that if we go from the top to the bottom, um, Athabasca gets pretty close to the top. Um, and so uh, we really do have a global panel here and a global conversation because the topic of conversation really has impact across the world or around the world. So um, without any further ado, I'll probably remind you from time to time about where to put your questions um, and respond. But without further ado, um, what we have, uh, and I'm just going to introduce the panel members and then invite them to provide their own personal introduction because I think it's a bit impersonal to, to read out a formal bio. Much more interesting to hear from the panel member themselves. But um, Sandra is our current um, president of Eden and she'll be opening out shortly. Um, Antonio is a past president of Eden and well known in European as well as ICDE circles. Um, in Pine, and I think we'll probably have to get your name pronunciation just right, um, comes from South Africa as a Commonwealth of Learning um, chair in OER. And then we have Neil, who is um, the president of Athabasca University, well known for its leadership in open and distance learning. So without further ado, Sandra, I'm going to invite you just to um, tell us a little bit more about your background, perhaps elaborate just briefly on your experience so far with the COVID-19 pandemic. And lastly, because it's late in the day here, at least in Europe, um, early for others, uh, one thing we may not know about you from the formal bio that I could have read. So, Sandra. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, I'm very happy that we are having today this uh, webinar with uh, joint efforts with ICDE. And I'm also very happy to see uh, so huge number of uh, participants from different countries and a special greet to my colleagues from Croatia. I'm calling here from Zagreb. And... Um, as I'm Mark already said, I'm present, uh, uh, president of uh, Eden, following uh, Antonio and Irina, uh, trying to follow their steps and do. Uh, they are already uh, very good work uh, to push forward. Um, basically, about me, I finished chemistry, but uh, for 20 years I'm doing e-learning. I have master in uh, digital education. Uh, and also PhD in information and communication technologies, uh, digital skills for uh, teachers in high, high education. Um, I'm doing um, all my life uh, e-learning and I think it's uh, very important to help teachers uh, to implement e-learning technologies into educational process 
So uh, currently I'm assistant director for education and user support at University Computing Center at University of Zagreb. And within this University Computing Center, we have the e-learning center, which is national center for uh, higher education uh, supporting e-learning. And regarding the COVID, um, I was uh, in charge uh, supporting teachers in higher education during uh, this uh, time. So basically for two, two months, uh, we have been working all days uh, to support all teachers who had to overnight uh, push their um, teaching into online environment. Uh, so it was a challenge, uh, and, but I think we re responded uh, in a quite uh, good way. Uh, apart from my primary work as a president of Eden, I also had to see how Eden should uh, respond to this challenge. And um, well, we started with this initiative of uh, online webinars uh, on uh, education in time of pandemic, uh, where we wanted to provide practical uh, information tips um, to help teachers how to deal uh, with this change. And um, this is, uh, I see, from what I see uh, so far, has been very good. Uh, in the autumn, we plan to move uh, to another series of these webinars, but I'll tell something about it uh, later. Also, challenge was that Eden Conference this year couldn't be face-to-face, -face, but it's going to be online. So this is our response to uh, this crisis. Uh, and in the end, um, what uh, should I... Uh, share with you that is not uh, very uh, very known well uh, when i was young i wanted to be uh, to work in the kindergarten with the infants and this is still my big wish so my uh, my colleagues at work uh, know that i like uh, small children and they try to bring from time to time their children uh, to work so that i get some time with them that's it well, thank you very much, Sandra. I was smiling and uh, sharing your uh, last point because some of my colleagues would sometimes describe that universities are just like big kindergartens and sometimes the academics have tantrums um, that are just slightly bigger than in scale than those that occur from preschoolers. Not sure if that's a good segue to you, Neil, but Neil, could you, um, as president of ICD, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background? Indeed. Uh, so uh, a huge thanks uh, to the to the group at Eden and Sandra uh, for for taking uh, bringing ICDE into this conversation. Uh, for those that I haven't had a, a pleasure of meeting, my name is Neil Fasina. Uh, I currently serve as the president of uh, Athabasca University in uh, just uh, Athabasca, Alberta, which is just north of Edmonton. Uh, also have the honor of serving as the president of ICDE uh, as uh, as we do face this uh, this this global health crisis, and and just want to say a, a huge shout out to whether or not I'm uh, wishing you good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, or in uh, in some cases I think good middle of the night uh, for for those that are tuning in from certain parts of the world. Uh, personal background. Uh, while I've been the, the president of Athabasca University for just about four years, I came to distance learning uh, serendipitously via a, a commitment to the mission uh, on, on both an administrative front, but also a personal front. And I'll get to that personal part at the very end here. Uh, but uh, my academic background is actually in uh, human resources and organizational behavior. And so that's where the, the, the distance space is, is relatively new as, as kind of four or six uh, years or so for me. Uh, but the, the commitment to mobilizing learning uh, around the, the world and, and creating universal equal access is, is truly where, where my passions rest as, as an administrator. So I think we're, we're quite fitting, uh, whether or not it be with ICDE, uh, with Eden's uh, mission as well, or, or with the mission of, of many of the institutions that everyone one is from where, where they're tuning in. In terms of uh, some experience with uh, COVID, uh, I'm going to say it's kind of three levels on the ICDE front, uh, very similar to, to what Sandra was saying, uh, you know, beyond making sure that our team members were safe and secure. Uh, it was about how do we mobilize resources to be able to support our members. And so whether or not it be through webinar opportunities or, or the uh, mobilization of, of digital resources to help 
uh, our members and, and their many team members uh, try to respond to, to what was a very quick uh, transition, transition over to uh, very digitally mediated environments. Uh, on a personal front, uh, I, I have the, the privilege now of working with a, a 12 and a 13 year old at home. Uh, and so it uh, it certainly makes for uh, some some new experiences, but uh, nevertheless, uh, very exciting to be able to watch uh, my kids now have to respond to a world that uh, that I've grown accustomed to, uh, being the president of AU. And then, last but not least, is is the AU response uh, again. First and foremost, making sure that uh, our learners and our team members were safe and secure. Uh, and then making sure that uh, we are trying to mobilize our resources to help uh, many uh, partners, whether or not it be in Canada or around the world, uh, move their environments into a, a very digital uh, first environment. So uh, it's it's very much, you know, as, as Mark was saying at the start, when, when you've got a, a background or a reputation of, of being a global leader in this space, uh, it, it's nice to be able to, to help as best we can uh, when other people are looking for that support. Uh, to close the loop around something you might not know about me and, and how I came to distance education, uh, I actually did uh, my wine education certification via distance. And so I, I've, I know what it's like to, to do something which many would expect is, is very physical and, and quote unquote lab based uh, via distance. And so, you know, it's, uh, I've, I've got the experience as the administrator, but also as the learner. But with that, Mark, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Well, thank you very much, Neil. And uh, that's an interesting uh, uh, experience that I personally didn't know about. So I'm not sure how you pour wine down the down the pipe as such. So uh, clearly that helps to answer the question that has come up over recent weeks and months about can anything be done online? Um, and I think generally the answer is yes to that, but perhaps uh, we might discuss that further in the panel. Um, Empine, can I ask you to give us a little bit about your background um, for the participants in today's webinar? Um, good afternoon, evening, morning, um, night. It, um, it, it's, it's such a great pleasure to be invited to this um, webinar today. My name is Mpine Makwe. I'm a Commonwealth of Learning Chair uh, in Open Education Resources and Open Education Practices at the University of South Africa, one of the largest and certainly the oldest distance teaching university in the world. I call it the grandmother of all university uh, distance teaching universities because it's the one that started as a correspondence many, many years ago, and then it changed to be an ODL institution. So we have tasted almost every other aspect of distance teaching and distance education over the years. Um, and a lot, of, a lot has changed. And um, besides being the Commonwealth of Learning Chair, I'm also very much involved in all associations of distance education, starting from the national distance education in South Africa and the regional one called DIASA. And I'm also the director of the African Council for Distance Education, as well as the ICDE, where I'm an OER ambassador, as well as uh, 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 working with the OER, OER RAC. It's the OER um, Advocacy Committee. And some few years ago, I think in 2015, we hosted the ICDE conference here at UNISA, where we started a doctoral consortium um, and where we invited different students who were doing, uh, who were in doctoral program for open distance learning. So it's one of the things that, that I personally contributed towards the, the ICDE. And, um, since March, mid-March, when we all went into lockdown, now I'm getting into the COVID story. When we all went into lockdown, we had to act very quickly. Um, and, and it affected all of us in different ways. And in developing context, as you know, that uh, resources are not easily available and things are a, a bit difficult. However, learning had to take place. Learning had to occur irrespective of what is going on. 
Then what, what I did as a community project, um, because I call it a community project because I'm dealing with people who are not students within the university. We developed a program that is based on OER. I just looked at OER that deals with how to teach online. And, and, and one was digital literacy course, that is an, an OERU course. And the other one was teaching, taking your teaching online, which is the open learn course. And I used those two courses and used mobile learning to support students who were involved in it. And in the first two weeks of just sending out an email of saying, any teacher out there who's interested, Here's a free course that they can go through it. And, and the response was just amazing. 300 people showed interest in the course. We're still running it. And some of them have finished the course and some of them have received badges, certificates. And you can tell very quickly that things are, are moving in the right direction. The thing with COVID is that you need to act and respond very quickly and rapidly. It doesn't give you time to think about how you need to plan to plan ahead. So we used both uh, online space that people are not familiar with and, and used mobile learning as, as something that people are familiar with just to provide that um, added support. And, and also we use a lot of peer support at developing little uh, uh, small groups so that they can support each other. Then the last thing about me that many people don't know, um, I, I'm not working from home. I'm at home trying to work. As you have seen, as I'm trying to talk to you, my daughter had to, to go across the room. So I had to ask, turn on the lights and whatever. And that's the type of teaching and probably that's the type of our work environment going to look like in future. And I actually love it. It's fine. Um, and I think as long as I'm I, 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 in my mind is I am working at, I'm not working at home. I am at home working. Thank you very much. And, and just to come back, that's a very interesting background. Was there one thing that we don't know about you that uh, <laughs> perhaps doesn't get revealed in your formal bio? Oh, okay. In my past life, I was a journalist. I uh, worked for, the, for a newspaper for a while before. Um, and when I got into higher education, I didn't know that I would last for a year. It was so slow and nothing was happening quick enough. But I found 20, more than 20 years later, I'm still in academic space. Prepares you well for the uh, fake news environment we live in today. <laughs> Antonio, I'm going to invite you to, um, you know the routine, uh, basically tell us a little bit about yourself, your COVID experience and something we may not know about you. Okay, well, uh, thanks a lot, Mark. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the invitation, the kind invitation. It's a pleasure uh, to be here, uh, well, to take the, to have the chance of participating in this, uh, this session, this debate and also to share it with um, a lot of friends, uh, uh, which is also, also very, very nice. Um, regarding my um, uh, my brief presentation, well, um, as well most know, I'm an associate professor at the Open University of Portugal. I'm currently the head of the Department of Education and Distance uh, Learning. Um, and well, in the past, I've been um, a president of Eden, as Sandra has already mentioned. Uh, but even before that, <laughs> I was also a pro-rector at the Open University of Portugal. And at that time, my task was exactly to uh, conceive and manage uh, the transition process or the transformation process from um, a paper-based university, a paper-based distance university, to a fully online university. So in a way, these, um, uh, well, this experience is not, uh, is a little bit acquainted to me, although the timing <laughs> is quite short this, uh, this turnaround. So uh, it, it's something that sounds familiar to me. Um, well, my basic training is in philosophy. So I'm a philosopher by training. Um, and uh, well, uh, well, uh, have a doctor in philosophy and all of these. I'm a, I'm a true PhD, which <laughs> not much can, <laughs> can uh, be proud of. Um, and uh, of course, besides the, uh, the, my uh, work at the Open University of Portugal, I'm also a researcher at the University of Lisbon. 
uh, and was you know, collaborate with uh, other universities um, around well, Europe and the world. Uh, and uh, even with uh, UNISA, I had already the pleasure of uh, uh, addressing the, the doctoral program that Mpina has started and well, uh, also collaborated with Sandra's University and so on. Um, regarding, um, uh, well, of course, my, my connection with university, however, although my basic training is in philosophy, has always been uh, linked with um, education, with the uh, field of education, and with distance ed education in particular. Well, um, uh, in that sense, um, so getting to the experience with the COVID-19, uh, well, my experience is slightly different from most of uh, the colleagues in the sense that uh, our university uh, works fully online. So um, the, the, these uh, crises did not present to us um, a need for changing of uh, the process of learning in this in the sense all the procedures uh, were kept uh, well as they were so um, there was no uh, big uh, impact regarding the learning process or teaching and learning process however uh, our students uh, were not uh, experiencing the same conditions as before so although we didn't have to change uh, the methodology in a sense we didn't have to trans to transform our way of teaching and, and also the way of, uh, of students learning, uh, we had to adjust and to adapt to a number of um, important um, uh, personal situations that are um, particular contexts that our students uh, had to meet with. And well, one of them uh, was exactly what uh, Neil was talking about and Mipin as well, which is everyone is now living uh, in the same in the same space, sharing the same space, working in the same space together, using the same equipment, and that presents a problem. Um, uh, anyway, uh, apart from, from this, uh, although the university works fully online, uh, it does, well, all the administrative part and, well, so the support services do not work online. And so we had to adjust the um, work environment at the university uh, to, uh, well, a remote uh, working uh, environment as well. So we are doing telework uh, across the university and that presented uh, a huge, uh, um, uh, well, managerial uh, uh, task, as you can imagine. Um, apart from this, of course, given our ex uh, particular expertise and experience, uh, we have been, well, most of us, myself and my colleagues, have been uh, asked by um, other universities and schools and, well, institutions and, and, and the teacher communities and, and all of this to share our knowledge with them, to support them. And we had even started uh, something which I think is quite interesting, which is a community that was actually, uh, well, created and managed by uh, the expert, um, um, to, uh, the experts in open and distance learning in Portugal. So the expert community had started an online community to support uh, the transition of the, the other colleagues to uh, online learning. Um, well, um, uh, getting to the to the point that Mark is pushing us to, which is basically tell us something that nobody knows or sell them <laughs> only if you know uh well uh well it's not a big secret but well i started my career actually as a tv director so uh even at the university at the open university uh my first interest was actually with educational tv uh but it was just a, a kind of a, a phase i wanted actually to to go to hollywood and fortunately it didn't happen still I'm still counting that I'll get there some way uh, in the future, somewhere in the future. But anyway, uh, that was my big secret. But anyway, uh, so it was also interesting, given my, that background. Uh, for me, it was a kind of a personal curiosity to see how much attached people are to using Zoom, uh, <laughs> which is quite, uh, quite interesting, uh, given that uh, uh, particular experience. So back to you, Mark. Well, thank you very much, uh, Antonio. And uh, I had an ulterior motive. I now know uh, things about all four of you that I didn't previously. But I guess to be fair to not only yourselves, but to the format that I uh, put there as a question, I should share something about myself. Um, I, I didn't pre-script this because there are a number of things I could share. Um, I don't think any of my colleagues, at least, um, um, those on the panel know this, there may be some of my colleagues that I work with, but my real name is not Mark Brown. 
and I'm not going to elaborate any further. Um, you can do all the internet research you like, but um, I've lived with this name for quite a while, but it's not my um, real name. So on that uh, intriguing note, uh, and not wanting to um, side uh, rail us, um, we're here to talk about uh, education and planning for education after the pandemic. I note there's already a question in that question that in itself, education after the pandemic, um, what sort of time frame are we thinking about? But I'm going to ask Sandra, and we'll just stick to the same order initially, and then we're going to mix things up for the participants, and we'll hopefully get the questions that you're posing in. We haven't got many questions yet, understandably, but um, as we get underway a little bit more around the question, please do share your questions in the Q&A box. So the question is, how do we plan for education after the pandemic, Sandra? What should we be thinking about right now? And I will just put a couple of qualifiers because we are an international panel, I wonder to what extent that thinking changes depending on when your semester cycle is and where you are located. So those are considerations we may have to think about. Sandra. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, I think that there is no uh, clear answer because um, lots of, uh, there are lots of different uh, educational scenarios and lots of countries, lots of uh, different heritage and cultures uh, and way of education. So everyone will adapt uh, to own needs, uh, what they think is the best. But uh, coming from traditional uh, uh, universities and very traditional environment where uh, the only education which is really appreciated uh, is the education which is done at the universities or at schools physically. Um, I would say that people, um, really need some different, uh, some very strong push to make changes. Uh, and I'm sure uh, that uh, some of them will try to go back to the time before. Um, although I think that uh, on, their way, on this way, they will find out it's not possible. But uh, from mistakes we learn. So um, basically it would be good if everyone would start to think now how to improve the education, teaching and learning, to define new strategies, uh, short-term or long-term strategies, how to include digital technologies is in a blended way or online way fully uh, into educational process, but uh, all things that should be included uh, into this. Uh, and I can elaborate about this a little bit further. But uh, basically, you will diff you, it is hard to change the mindset of people. And I think this is what we have to focus on because it's not only teachers and students, it's, only, it's also management, administ administrative, uh, parents, uh, community, uh, uh, society as such. Uh, we had seen the, the, the rise of MOOCs. Uh, they were really something new, but uh, they're still here, but they didn't change everything over the night. Uh, with uh, open uh, the education, uh, we are working on it, we are pushing, pushing it so much, but still we are not uh, making it as, uh, as the mainstream. So there are lots of challenges and I think that people who, who did fully face-to-face -face teaching and learning will try to find a way to go back, but they will find eventually that it's not possible to be, we are talking about new new present, uh, present and future present, there are no three ways of going back. Thank you, Sandra. And I think you um, identified something very important that I should probably have um, made more known at the outset is in our panel, we don't only have geographical representation, different leadership roles, but we have different types of institutions. And I'm sure there are many um, people who are participating here today who come from universities or institutions that are traditionally campus-based. Um, my own institution is primarily campus-based with a smaller online program. But Neil, I'm going to hand over to you because you're coming from a fully online institution. So I'm wondering how that question might look from your institutional perspective, but no doubt you're also having conversations with colleagues in more traditional institutions as well, particularly um, wearing your multiple hats.
In, indeed, Mark. And and I think I'm going to probably echo a little bit of what Sandra said and, and potentially preempt a little bit of what Antonio is going to get to as as also a fully digital uh, environment. And and I think something that I said in a in a different context was that the, the future of learning is already here. It, it arrived at the beginning of 2020. The challenge was is that we weren't globally ready for it. Uh, the, the concept of technology being embedded and ubiquitous in, in education is coming. And it just, some of us, uh, you know, in, in the case of pure online institutions, we're fully embedded in that environment. Uh, those institutions that were uh, in the traditional place-based uh, learning environment might have been uh, trying new things out, but weren't really sort of into the, into the deep end of that, uh, that learning uh, curve yet. And I think, and this is where I'm going to suggest, that, or I'm sorry, I'm going to build on, on what Sandra said, and that is we have to recognize that learning has been disrupted, period. And, and the concept of going back and trying to embrace what used to be there without seizing the chance to actually learn from what we've, we've all had to do and embrace some new things, I, I think we actually, if, if we if we actually try to go back to what it was before, we're actually going to do a disservice to our learners. Um, you know, in, in one of the, the, the question in the, in the question box is, you know, around assessment. And we've got a chance now to actually zero in on how do we create fully immersive quality, whether or not it be learning experiences or new approaches to assessment in a way that we didn't before we're because we're, today we're doing it from a place of discomfort before we were doing it from a place of comfort right and so we, we tend to be a little bit more uh, willing if we're already in the in the uncomfortable spot but we need to definitely think about how do we amplify quality the the second piece that i want to say is as we're planning for the future is that we also need to know that our learners have been disrupted they are now going to be expecting something entirely different. Um, and we've got, again, a chance to reinvent how we bring learning opportunities to, to, the, to the broader community that is authentically student first, right? That we, we enable the learner to, to identify what their needs are and, and enable them to curate their own learning pathway. But in order to do that, we need to challenge the assumptions that we have within our own institutions. We, we authentically need to break our own systems, if you will, to make sure that we're not just trying to adapt what we do today to a new reality. And I, I'd say that that's that last point that I just want to make, is that moving to a digital first environment does not mean taking your place-based experience and trying to digitize it. It actually means starting from a digital experience. What's the ultimate digital experience and how do we make it look like a learning opportunity? Right. Rather than saying, how do I take a classroom and make it digital? And so, Mark, I'll leave it with that because uh, others have got, uh, I'm, I'm sure, incredible things to say as well. Well, thanks, Neil. I, I was just jotting down a few notes there. Um, that last comment effectively around planning for digital first. Uh, and of course, one of the things you mentioned is how the, the future of learning is already here. Uh, in my own um, observations on COVID-19, I've often said or I've written that the pandemic has fast-tracked the future um, and it's very hard to go back. But on that note, I'm going to hang back and uh, hear from our next panel member. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I, think, I think Neil talks from our, the perspective of uh, um, distance education and, and online learning, those kind of universities that we've been and the universities that have been preaching about moving to this mediated form of learning and all the time we've been questioned about quality. And when you ask our colleagues who are questioning us about quality and we say, what do you mean by quality? They say, but you don't know if the student who has written the assignment is the same student that, that is, is going to be examined or all those things. So, and I always tell them that we are not here to police people. We just have to do assessment in a different way. But I think, I think um, planning for the future, for, for education of the future starts 
now, especially during the crisis. If we do not take the opportunity during the crisis to plan for the future that we aspire for, that we want, um, we are going to be left behind. During the crisis phase, obviously, we we respond to the crisis. We, we, we start with little projects that will assist us to survive during the, it's all about survival, to survive during this phase. However, as we survive during this phase, we need to think about the rec recovery phase, the recovery plan. What is it that we want to do? What is it that we want to keep uh, that has worked during the crisis? Because I believe that if something works during the crisis, it's bound to work even during, even during good times. Because if it survived the storms, it's definitely going to survive when, when everything, it's, it's, it's all good. So during the crisis phase, I, I've jotted down that the biggest thing, the biggest challenge that we found is that many people are not trained to go online. And all of a sudden they're expected to move everything to an online space. And as Neil puts it, they take a classroom as it is and put it into an online space. And that doesn't work. So, so then you find many people coming to us uh, asking how how is this done and and all that and 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 we find ourselves and even even um, Sandra was talking about it we find ourselves having to professionalize having to 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 teach people how to use staff development that's that's number one that you need to do uh, during the crisis so that you get people who know what they're doing and as they moving moving along in in my case we started uh, developing. As staff, community teachers, community teachers in the community to be to enable them to teach online. Now it is during this period again that we need to think about the recovery phase and the sustainability phase. And in the in the uh, recovery phase, we need to to think about how to implement measures to regain lost time, lost time if we, we want to regain lost time, how institutions should start preparing, investing and reinforcing. Because now we are looking at different business models that universities are comfortable with. What type of business models will work in the, in the next phase? And then when we deal, and then it is also at that time when leadership needs to rethink the university space. You know, a leadership need to rethink what the purpose of education is, which takes us back to the mission of, of, of education. Because even before COVID, um, we were already being told how irrelevant we are in higher education. We produce people who are irrelevant and all that. And COVID now is forcing us how irrelevant we were. We, were, we kept on covering that and, and saying, no, we are fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But COVID, COVID showed us when we couldn't move quickly enough to get into the world that the world wants us to be at. Banks continue doing their work. Other sectors continue to, to do their work. But it's in higher education where we find it so difficult. We are even saying we need to start trying to open up education face to face, but I'll just leave it at that. But I think those three phases are very critical now during the crisis, the crisis phase, the recovery phase, and the sustainability phase, because that will help us to know where we are going. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's really, uh, I think, articulated very clearly how we need to think about the different stages um, and it will link back into what I hope to bring in shortly after giving Antonio uh, a chance to respond, a couple of the questions that have come through um, that might want to take that conversation even further. But before I do so, Antonio. Okay. Uh, well, um, just a couple of uh, remarks following uh, uh, what has already been said. First of all, um, well, it comes to my mind uh, the title of a Needham conference that we organized uh, at the start of the decade in Greece, well, at the height of the uh, financial crisis. And, uh, and the title of the conference was Never Waste a Crisis. And this is uh, more true than ever. Well, we shouldn't wait this crisis. Uh, getting back to the, to the point, what will happen after the pandemic? Well, first of all, we don't know how much time it will uh, last the pandemic and its effects. 
Secondly, we don't know what uh, the impacts will be uh, in social terms, economical terms, and all of this. And this will have also impact on how education systems will, uh, how they will evolve. Um, I'll give you an example. If, as it most poss possibly it will happen, uh, um, there will be a need for institutions to downsize, to focus on, on cutting costs, on, on, on also widening the outreach to many uh, learners who could not afford uh, to pay the tuition fees and all of this, this will imply a lot of uh, transformation uh, in how uh, higher education and other uh, public um, education institutions uh, are providing education. And how, of course, uh, online uh, learning uh, could um, become mainstream in a sense. So this will be also be important. We don't know exactly at this point how this will change, but definitely there will be some change. As uh, Sandra was pointing out, uh, as we le learn from uh, previous uh, phenomena, well, even the MOOC phenomena, although the MOOC phenomena is different uh, in many ways from what is happening now. Um, of course, um, what we are now expecting as the big change which will not occur exactly as such. What we can know for sure is that something will change dramatically in, this, in, in, in most probably, but it will not change in the way that we are thinking that it will change. And we're not still ready to understand the change process that will occur. Secondly, we're, because we're still in the middle of it. Uh, secondly, uh, it is true what Neil was saying that um, uh, from a, a first point, of, well, a kind of a, um, from a first uh, perspective, well, a prior perspective, we can say that what this crisis has clearly done was to accelerate to a, a large extent and also to uh, sc uh, scale up what was already happening. So. The digital trans the transformation of the higher education system, for instance, was already occurring. But this has uh, changed it overnight in the sense that it gave it a speed and a scale that we were not expecting that it would have. However, we should also uh, pay attention to the fact that this increase in speed and scale is, is also creating a new reality that we are not uh, prepared for uh, um, taking into, into account. Because from over, I mean, we'll give you an example. Even at the end of last year in Portugal, it was approved a, a legislation, well, a specific uh, law, an act, a distance education act, uh, in which there was a kind of a um, kind of a goal, a long-term goal that was uh, in in the space of well, uh, in a decade, to increase uh, the number of uh, online uh, formal online le learning students by threefold by well, going from 10,000 to 30,000. Well, it just in six months, it exploded to hundreds of thousands. So, uh, and of course, everything that was planned in, in, that, in that specific legislation or legal framework is now basically outdated. Uh, so this is something that it's not just scaling up and speeding up. It's a new phenomenon that we have to understand. Uh, as Sandra was also uh, pointing out, there's uh, what is most, uh, and, and from my own experience, what is most difficult and it takes more time to change is the mindset. Basically, a transformation process as the ones that we're discussing is in its essence, a cultural process. And we are, we're basically changing the culture of learning and the culture of teaching. And that is something that is not just done by changing technology, methodology, it's more than that. And so, uh, uh, getting to the to the main question, how do we plan for education after the pandemic? I think that all the actors uh, are co called to have some kind of action, from uh, the uh, a govern a governmental perspective, from from the perspective of top leadership in terms of well, national leadership at least, or international leadership as well. Um, it's important that new legal frameworks are designed that are flexible enough. To, um, to be, in a way, uh, f facilitators of this change process. Uh, secondly, um, it is also important that from institutional uh, leadership perspective, 
sustainable um, strategies, long, mid-term and long-term strategies are designed and implemented uh, that are uh, designed in an holistic way, uh, um, including all the main actors of, uh, of their communities and uh, having a clear focus on the cultural change of the institution. From the teacher's perspective, of course, one of the most uh, clear lessons from this uh, uh, crisis is the fact that all the teacher training that has been conducted basically failed. And it was obvious that it was going to fail because most of the teacher training that was conducted was not done in a, um, in a, in a how can I say, uh, immersive way. So people learn to teach online without priorly being ever uh, having any kind of experience as an online learner and that is a dramatic uh, uh, factor uh, in, in this sense uh, i mean uh, in, uh, bearing in mind the experience that we had at open university of portugal that was a critical aspect the fact that we've made it mandatory that anyone could only become an online teacher after having first uh, having an online learning experience an immersive one following the same pedagogical model and so on, it was critical, uh, uh, of course. From a learner's perspective, and that is something that is also an important lesson, and we should have known it before. Learners, they are not necessary, even if they are digital contents from the sense of, uh, well, um, um, managing technology, they are not necessarily digital literates from the perspective of online learning. They have to be trained. They have to experience before. They have to adjust to this new environment because they never had, most of them never had that experience before. And so there is also the need to train uh, students to give them uh, the opportunity to learn how to learn in this environment. So um, of course, there are a number of other things. It's, it's a complex issue. But basically, I would state that uh, most, and of course, well, we, it's also a lesson from the pandemic. We have to uh, include also families and the communities. They, are, they play a major role in this, uh, either supporting or exactly uh, uh, making some kind of obstacle to the changing process. Well, back to you, Mark. Well, thank you, Antonio. Uh, Antonio. Uh, I um, let that conversation uh, run uh, from all the four panelists, because it really was the core of the question that we posed. But as you can tell, there is no simple answer here. And I, I want to turn a little bit now to some of the questions that have been posed that really flow out of um, what you've said. And the very first one, I'm just going to ask for a really quick answer before we shift to maybe thinking a little bit more to the future. The first question is around, um, I'll say, evaluation. I'm wanting to know whether, because I guess we're still, as someone said right at the outset, we're still in the pandemic. And one of the observations was, when is the pandemic going to end? What planning timeframe are we working to? So my very short question is, in your institution, have you had enough time yet to really reflect and evaluate on the experience to date? Um, whoever wants to take that, first off. Okay, can I can I try? Uh, well, I would say we didn't have time. We didn't have time. We are trying to ensure that teaching has moved to to online environment and to finish the academic year. At the moment, the focus is on uh, exams and how to finish the academic year. I hope that we will try to think about it and to reflect much more. Uh, uh, now when uh, the exams finish. Uh, I just have to say that uh, in Croatia, we had additional uh, uh, catastrophe. We had a strong earthquake, earthquake in Zagreb and lots of faculties are not able to move back to their premises. So we have two challenges uh, as well. But uh, at the moment, uh, teachers and institutions are looking how to save the academic year. Right, so the short answer from Sandra is not yet. How about you and Pony? I, th I think the problem is the same. Um, and, and I think that's the, how education institutions has been structured. We are in a pandemic. And yes, we understand that we're in a pandemic, but we are not even focusing on that. We are focusing on how best can we get 
the students to how can how best can we pour as much information into into their heads so that they can write an exam so that there's an exit point we are not even thinking about how best to use this pandemic at this time to develop systems that are going to be, to sustain the type of education we want and even thinking about that all we are thinking about is how to how to make sure that the students go through and and we are not even thinking about the um the calendar year and all the things that goes with it because in my view we should just have stopped the calendar year and and refocused so that when we go and who said we should start in this time and end this time why are we still following things that maybe are not even working so interesting neil what about your organization and institution uh, short answer, Mark, is that we haven't had the chance to to sit back and reflect on on the pandemic itself, uh, but what it has forced us to do in short order is actually reflect on the direction we were heading to begin with, and because it's it's forced us to accelerate many of the questions we had anticipated answering, uh, but not immediately. So, as an example, the the assessment question. Uh, so, even for a fully digital university, we had to question physical based uh, assessments right so it, it we've we've been forced to think through and reflect on some of the assumptions that we have uh, but not necessarily on the pandemic itself so i'm getting a, a picture here and i'll let antonio come in last sorry again i'll give you first dibs next but is this is very much reactive uh, might be not fair to say planning on the fly because it sounds like from Neil's last answer, some of this was in the pipeline. But I think in answering and reflecting on uh, the question of how do we plan for the future, I just wanted to make it really clear for all the participants that I guess we're trying to answer that question where we're still in the forest a little bit. Antonio. Well, Mark, or should I say alias Mark? <laughs> well, Mark, actually, uh, in our case, um, it's interesting because, well, we're basically facing the same uh, problem as uh, all the other um, institutions and the colleagues have already said. Of course, we're still in the, in the midst of the pandemic, we're in, the, in the middle of the crisis, and we have to um, uh, finish uh, the, the current uh, academic year and only now are starting to plan the next academic year. However, there has been uh, interesting development, uh, especially linked with this, of course, this hot topic of assessment, uh, because we had the same problem. I mean, all the distance uh, universities, uh, distance teaching and distance learning universities had the same issue because of uh, uh, usually of uh, governmental regulations. We should, uh, we were obliged, where it was mandatory to have a physical uh, examination, I mean, uh, physically conducted uh, exams. And uh, of course, I mean, this is clearly impossible. It's impossible for us, but also for the other universities. And that was a change, a game changer, in the sense that government and society in general understood, well, it's not working. And we have to uh, find a different solution. Uh, of course, the, um, uh, and this, in this sense, I think there was a very positive development, not just uh, regarding the university, but the community in general, the higher education in particular. Uh, uh, people understood um, that um, not only uh, it was difficult to adjust the exam examination uh, process to the new, um, uh, well, the new conditions, uh, even to conduct it online because there was of course all of these issues that are uh, well known uh, but these also led to people start asking well but maybe this is not the best way to assess and this is for me the most important thing uh, it's happening step by step it's not clear still but uh, step by step people are understanding that they have to change uh, assessment methodology and to change it in a way that it becomes uh, much more um, a continuous process and, of course, a, a process that is related also uh, on how we can collect evidences of learning outcomes and how can we actually uh, conduct a more, um, I mean, a, 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 better, uh, a, a better way of assessing uh, the competencies that uh, should be developed by the, by the students. So, Tani, I'm going to pack assessment up for the moment. We may get a chance to come back to that. I know that's a very topical issue. We've had webinars on that. 
but I want to ensure that we do have time to think about the future. The reason I just wanted to come in with the question, as I said, is I think we need to understand that our current reflections are a product of where we're at at the moment, and we're all in different situations in different countries. But the question that I thought um, is very relevant that was posed in the Q&A is what type of changes do we actually expect? The original question was how? How are we planning? But there's a what are we planning for question. Um, and so, Neil, I thought I'll give you the first chance this time. Um, what uh, is it that you're wanting to see come out of this? Another way of looking at this, I know some institutions have been involved, my own, in, in scenario planning, but there's the concept of backcasting. What is it we want and how might we work backwards? Um, but, Neil, basically the question here is for all the panellists is, what is it that we should be planning for? Well, well, uh, since that you asked me to <laughs> start uh, answering. Um, well, one important thing that I, th uh, I believe that it should be clear for us as well is that this uh, process has also transformed the field in the sense that we are now, I mean, uh, the experts and uh, uh, traditional uh, uh, distance education and online uh, learning uh, practitioners, we are not now the owners of the field, we are just a small minority. And the actual field is now made up of all the, uh, the, the other ones who are now practitioners, even against their will in some cases. <laughs> so um, we, uh, when we say what do we expect will happen, uh, we should be careful about, uh, about that because what will happen, it will not depend only on uh, what would be um, a typical uh, development process regarding the, the how the field would evolve. Uh, anyway, uh, what I would uh, be hoping for, hoping for in, in particular, would be uh, a clear um, emergence of uh, good strategic strategic planning uh, regarding leadership, uh, a, a new uh, importance given by uh, governments. Uh, to uh, legislation and regulation of uh, online learning uh, provision. Also importantly, uh, because it, it, it is critical, uh, a new, uh, much more um, improved uh, model of teacher training, uh, much better use of resources in terms of the investment in the, in the, in the infrastructure, uh, in, in, in the infrastructure capability of institutions. Also, very importantly, given uh, given uh, a more uh, more space a more opportunity to students to um, participate in the process of co-design uh, uh, their own learning processes uh, and well I'm gonna stop you there antonio because otherwise you're going to leave nothing for right. anyone else to say <laughs> um, so without wanting to be too biased on the balance of gender here i'm let neil come in first and then you can debate uh, Sandra and Brian when you want to come in. Neil. All right, thanks, Mark. Uh, you know, recognizing again, not wanting to, to lose the chance on, on seizing a crisis. I think we've got an opportunity to plan for the future that we want, not the future that is going to be handed to us. And so with us reimagining work, reimagining community, reimagining uh, family, re the need for learning is going to go up not down. And so I think we need to plan for greater access. And the, and the way that we're going to be able to do that is by bringing together the place-based and the digital. It's not about one being better than the other. It's about recognizing the value of each and how they can complement each other rather than try to, uh, try to displace each other. I think that's going to end up creating better choice uh, for learners. It's going to end up creating better quality, whether or not it be on the digital side or the place-based side. Uh, but, but authentically, it is, to me, about trying to meet the needs of the learner wherever they are and, and being able to adopt some of the pieces that we're seeing today out of force, uh, but actually being able to mold them so that they actually create fantastic opportunities uh, and but we need to actually seize it and say that's the future we want as compared to saying geez I, you know i wonder where this pandemic is going to leave us let's look at the, the the silver lining on what is a very very dark health crisis and say how do we how do we actually achieve learning goals that we've been talking about for a generation 
but we can do it quickly now. We, we won't get it perfect, but let's at least make it there. Thanks, Neil. I see a lot of shaking heads, nodding heads, I should say, amongst the panel, and I hope that resonates with many of the participants. I'm wondering how that um, resonates with you in Africa uh, as a continent and a developing continent, that shifting the discourse from education in a crisis to education for change. What's the sort of change you're hoping to see uh, in Pioneer? Thank you very much again. Um, I think, I think also, I, I also tried to to check out what uh, type of change that was brought in by earlier pandemics. We are not new in, in in pandemics; they've been there before. And what is it that we have learned from them? And yes, they were there, but they had not been at the scale at which they are in right now. And if you can see other, other systems, how it worked, there were certain things that, that was happening, especially in the education sector. But because education is, is controlled by so many um, bodies, uh, regulatory bodies especially, they, 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 they tied up so much to something that they want to, to they, that, that they control. And, and again, we'll go to assessment. Part of the reason that in distance education, we still have face-to-face um, -face assessment when everything else is at a distance is because of that. There is something that they, they associate that with quality. So I think we need to rethink our higher education rethink the mission of the university. It's one thing to say we teach, it's about teaching and learning and research and community engagement without involving the people who we are trying, without involving the future of the people that we are producing. Because that's what we are saying. It's all about me who teaches you what I think you should get, rather than you coming back and telling me this is what I can do. And, and we wonder why we are not getting innovative people. And we wonder why we are not getting creative people because we do not allow people to be creative enough. We don't, we don't give them that space. I think for me, education needs to be a little bit open and a little bit creative so that then we can be able to move towards the future that we all aspire for, not the future that has been established by the industrial era and agricultural era. And, and also, I mean, it will impact on the time that we use for different things. Um, Thank you very much. And Sandra, I'll give you the chance here to um, equally come back with that longer term horizon, the kind of future we want. Yeah, well, uh, I would start, start from the point that actually we do have lots of strategies, national strategies on education. We have uh, European uh, Commission recommendations on education and digital technologies. So we have uh, the, the background which can provide us to, to move things into action. What is the point that we are still not eager to make some changes and move from the paper to the practice? Uh, when the, the, the government decides that they want to do some changing, changes, really changes, and invest uh, the time and people into this, then we will have some changes. Otherwise, it will be just paper strategy and nothing else. But when you say to teachers, you have to change the way you are teaching, what does that actually mean? They have their workload. If it's not change in the, the, the frameworks and the regulations, are they allowed to change the way they, are te they teach? Uh, also, curricula, it has to be adopted on the university and a national level. If it's not able to change it uh, into move more blended or online way, how it's possible to be done? So we have to, and so much, so much more. Teacher training, Antonio said, we have to really think about it. For, for example, for higher education teacher, teacher training is not compulsory. It's option which is usually left to teachers. So we do need to make environment that will enhance uh, and motivate teachers to make the changes. And this is where I see the role of uh, institutions and government and European Commission to force this push. We have a good start 
with the COVID. So it opens the door and stressed us to show that changes can be done, but take this as opportunity to do some real changes on a national level. Although the government doesn't say they find education important and they want digital citizens, changes will not happen systematically. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. That was spoken with some real conviction, I have to say. Um, folks, if you're wondering, we'll probably continue for about another 10 minutes. Um, we, we left the time a little open, depending on the number of questions. I want to come back with what I'll call the elevator question, because each of you in your own way touched on the importance of our policymakers um, and also our educational leaders. So, Neil, you're going to be first in the spot in the elevator with the Minister of Education for Canada, shall we say, or someone in a very important policy-making role. What's the one thing you're going to tell them they have to do post-COVID-19 to higher education? Wow. The, the one, the one thing, Mark. <laughs> the elevator started. It better be a tall building. Uh, I, I think it's it's a, a function of making sure that we are investing in the parts of education that are going to create authentic change. And I liked how someone used the words education for change. I think those were yours, Mark. It's about investing in the digital literacy. It's about investing in people's knowledge, skills, abilities for the future. So when we have to deal with another black swan event like this, uh, we've got a society that's ready for it. Thing, and you did that before you got to the floor. So excellent. Um, Empire, the, how, how's the, the elevator is about to take off? Okay, maybe before I even get to the elevator, one of the biggest challenges in developing countries is the issue of connectivity, infrastructure, all those things that are very critical for digital technologies. Now, the person who, who will ensure, the ministry that ensures that there's digital and connectivity is one minister. And the, mini the other minister who deals with education is another minister. And the other minister who deals with other issues, labor and what, it's another minister. So we, we need this, all this group of people to come together and work together. And one says, this is what I will provide uh, in order for, 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 for connectivity to happen, infrastructure needs to be developed for this particular purpose. And, and then, then you get higher education telling the, the tech guy that this is what I will need for education purposes. So you need this very strong partnership, not only in government, but in all other industries that deals with, with, with technology. Because once we get that very strong partnership from the government perspective, and then you get also regulatory bodies that are also having their own issues, that everybody needs to be at par so that we all understand how to move forward with this particular issue. As, as it stands right now, when everybody is trying to commit, com compete with each other, it's not gonna work. So if I extend my uh, elevator question, what you're really saying is we need actually probably quite a large elevator or lift uh, that fits all of the stakeholders in there mm -hmm. so they can be starting to talk to each other. Antonio, your one thing as you get in the elevator. Well, uh, in my case, if I look at the situation in Portugal, I will, I will tell the minister, well, take us seriously. Uh, because for, for some time it has been uh, quite a, quite a hard uh, task to to help. Uh, I mean, to have him take the distance learning and online learning seriously. And uh, both what Neil said and Mapina said, and well, other things that we could add, uh, lead to that question. I mean, um, what we are discussing now is that the entire higher education, but also the other subsectors of, uh, of the education system, will become hybrid. And becoming hybrid does not mean necessarily blended. It's a different thing. So uh, provision will become much more diverse. Uh, there will be blended, there will be online, there will be face-to-face, uh, -face, and they will be mixed. And in the in the same um, in the, the same student in the same program, for instance, could um, include parts online, parts blended, and so on. Ding. And, You've hit the floor. 
So your time is up. The minister is gone. So, uh, but, uh, well, I don't need money for that. But if you could lend us some money, that would be helpful. <laughs> well, thanks, Antonio. I hope I didn't mean to cut you off too much there. But it was just useful to kind of hear how you have to crystallize that. I'm going to um, have just two questions I'm going to pose. The first is just going to go to Sandra and Neil in their respective roles as uh, presidents of two professional bodies. So my question is, what role should Eden or ICDE play in the current crisis or thinking perhaps to the future? Um, Sandra, do you want to take that initially? Thank you, Mark. But I, I just want to take the advantage to also ask, uh, say something about elevator because I, I missed that that one. I will be short. Uh, the, the, this uh, crisis, the, the health issue uh, showed us that uh, we could move fully online because I have been listening from teachers uh, and institutions for a decade that some subjects and some courses cannot move online. Now we have seen that it's possible. And my, my uh, message uh, would be, what, what is your target group, universities and government? It's student and they should be in a focus. And in order to provide good quality education for students, we have to train the teachers to be motivated and skilled for that. And regarding the, the, the Eden part, well, I think that association as Eden and ICD uh, are really a um, good place to collect um, examples, good case studies, experience, know-how to share information and gather community. Uh, to, 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 to foster some changes, you know, um, because people uh, always like to get around someone. And as usual, we say at Eden, we are like a family. So we gather a bunch of people around us and this bunch is growing and growing through each year. Uh, and we share, we communicate, we collaborate. And this is importance of such association so that you have some place where you can go and find people of similar ideas, similar thinking, who I wish to collaborate and share. And this is the future uh, of such associations. We are very much connected for, to the European Commission. And for example, uh, in the Eden Conference uh, now in June, we will have a person from European Commission presenting the new digital agenda. Uh, and this is very important that this is uh, Eden is such as way a communication channel to push these news uh, to, the, to the community. So I think that uh, the importance of association uh, as ours uh, will grow. Thanks, Sandra, and a little plug there for the Eden Conference. Um, but one other thing to alert participants to that the European Commission is taking a lead on, but I think accelerated by the COVID-19 um, pandemic is uh, really putting some serious conversation around micro-credentialing and rethinking, because this has not come up, we've talked about assessment, but actually the qualification framework that we operate within. But Neil, ICDE. You bet. So I'm going to say three things. Uh, the first is making sure that we're connecting members to each other so that, in essence, they're able to help each other regardless of where they are in the journey in response to the health crisis. So for those that uh, that might be at the, the front edge of, of digitally enabled, then we can create communities of practice there. For those that are new to the digital space, how do we provide communities of practice and then uh, support systems as well? I'm going to agree with Sandra. Uh, another way that we can do it is advocacy. This is a moment to show how uh, distributed learning is a viable alternative globally. And so we can, we can actually do that through demonstrating success on how people have actually done it in a positive way. And then the last piece, Mark, I think, is that we need to also, once we start to see the, the surface of this health crisis, is get the globe thinking about what the actual future of learning is. So if the future of learning is already here, what's the next iteration and how do we start starting embedding some of those pieces uh, now so we're not dealing with this the next time uh, we're, we're in, a, in a crisis scenario. Thanks Neil, that's a perfect segue I think to what will be the final kind of wrap up for each panel member. Just a, a short answer please, just conscious of one eye on the time. Um, so what's one positive outcome that we can already take from 
the COVID-19 experience as we look to the future. I know it's come up that it's a crisis as an opportunity, but what is that one opportunity um, or one experience? Antonio, first off, since you were the last at the beginning, well, if I may just to add a, a small thing to the previous uh, question, I would also add that uh, both uh, ICD Eden are um, um, a stronghold and actually uh, have a, um, a, leg a, a, a powerful legacy of know-how and expertise. So their communities of experts and they represent, uh, well, in the case of, uh, of ICD, nine decades, in the case of Eden, three decades, of tremendous expertise, the best expertise in the field. And this is critical in order to facilitate the process that we were just discussing. As for the positive thing, um, I believe that um, probably um, given all the circumstances, uh, this experience has actually came out quite well. Uh, and uh, we now have a tremendous amount of, of people both teachers, uh, students, uh, well, families and so on, that are engaged in online learning, that understand what it's all about, and they want to uh, uh, to actually continue that experience. Obvious, obviously, they have uh, suggestions for improvement, they would, would have expectations for improvement, but now they're, on, they're online in this sense. And this is accelerate, has accelerated tremendously the development of the field, and this is possible, probably, in my view, uh, the largest, uh, the largest, um, well, uh, good thing coming out from this crisis. Thank you, uh, Impani. I think, I think, for me, what what came out from COVID, it 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 brought out the the issue of um, people who don't have. Very, very, and all of a sudden we are, we are, we have that limelight that certain people do not have access to education resources as we expect them to be, and and however, it also brought out this um, willingness and 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 the need to do things differently from people, which which has not been there. It has removed us from the comfort zone to a zone that we don't know, but we don't mind getting into that zone where we are able to do things differently. So even in future, when we come back and say, let's do this, people are more willing to go that route than they ever used to be because it, we, it removed what we know and, and just put us into a world that we don't know and we're surviving in it. Thank you. Well said. I think that's very much you, you pose your own limits in many respects. Neil. Uh, I'm going to take this to a kind of a humanistic lens. Uh, you know, I will talk about human potential being equally distributed uh, around the planet, but uh, consistent with what was just said, the, the opportunity to access education in order to harness that potential is not. And I think what this crisis has has demonstrated is that the crisis has not discriminated. Everyone is in it. And so it has shown that we are all human, right? And, and it's it's a chance for us to, to look critically at how do we create opportunity where there is universal equal access to education. So we, we've, we've seen the barriers front and center now for the last number of months let's start dismantling them. Let's start actually taking on the, the, the potential that is, that is brought forward through education. Thank you, Neil. That, that's a powerful message. And Sandra? Well, um, I would say the positive experience is that we actually got the experience of working online. Um, it's like, you know, um, we had to jump from the ship, uh, but we didn't drown. We uh, managed to stay uh, with above the water with our heads, but the experience is different from person to person. What we have to make sure that this experience goes to positive, not to negative. Uh, also, it enables us to be aware of what competencies we have and or which one we lack. But also it enables us to, us to see what we are lacking uh, in an environmental uh, level. Uh, so um, 
we have experience, that's very good. So it's upon us to decide what to do with it. And that's a really lovely note, I think, to finish on. Um, apart from, if I can, just add my own comment, uh, the one item I think that I'm taking from the experience is just how important, uh, some are calling it the pedagogy of care, uh, a better appreciation of the role that emotions, uh, the affective side of learning plays, not just for learners, but also for our those who are involved in teaching. Um, Clearly, um, participants, we haven't been able to answer all your questions. We've tried to uh, explore and, and investigate and respond to some of the higher order questions. Some of the other questions, there's a very detailed question on OER. We might get the opportunity to follow up in a follow-up webinar on OER. Um, but I would like to thank um, the panel members for their contribution. Um, I found it very interesting hearing what others have been saying. I've clearly been doing a lot of thinking myself in my own institution and talking with colleagues. I think we're all grappling with the same sorts of questions just mm -hmm. in different contexts. And perhaps the one takeaway for me is that we are so still in the pandemic that it's hard for us to stand back as leaders and see where we need to go from here. But for me, that's perhaps the one takeaway for everyone is we need leadership at this time. Leadership in a time of crisis is crucial and the right type of leadership. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, webinar will be available in the next day or so for those who want to go back and listen um, or share it with um, their colleagues. And we hope to follow up with all, any of the questions that we haven't been able to answer over the next week and come back to you with some responses. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. And, and congratulations, Mark, for the uh, moderation. <laughs>